Please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans. We're in the second chapter this week. We continue our series through uh, the book of Romans. And today we're going to be addressing a passage from Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Um, This particular passage of Scripture is part of um, a segment of the book of Romans that is important. Uh, Beginning at chapter 1, verse 18, Paul sets out uh, to establish the fact that all of mankind is lost. And so it's important for us to remember the immediate context of our passage and not get lost in in just looking at, at the 11 verses that we're looking at. We need to remember this is part of the letter to uh, the Romans, and it is also part of a segment where Paul is working to establish the truth that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's going to be his summation uh, in Romans chapter 3. And uh, with that in mind, let's take a look at Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And we've uh, entitled our message today, Is Being Good, Good Enough? Is Being Good, Good Enough? Paul says, therefore, you have no excuse, you foolish person, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that matter in which you judge someone else, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. 
And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, you foolish person who passes judgment on those who practice such things and yet does them as well, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and restraint and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will repay each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But to those who are self-serving and who do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, he will give wrath and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of mankind who does evil, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who does what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. It is not uncommon for us to hear the expression, he's a good person. You've probably uh, said that yourself to describe individuals that you know. Um, we, we hear this at, at funerals quite often. He was such a good man or she was such a good person. And we uh, use that phrase to describe an individual who is certainly above average and excels in a variety of character traits that we admire, a summation to their life where we say, this, is, this has been a good life. Most people intend to please God on the basis of their own goodness. And this is an important thing for us to take note of. And, and if, if you would, please, please pay attention to this because this is going to be kind of the theme that we follow through this whole message. The fact that it is natural for people to say to themselves, well, I, I'm good, I'll, I will, I'll, I'll go to heaven. I am a good person, God will accept me. Um, in fact, a less than careful reading of our text might lead you to the same conclusion. If you simply looked at our scripture text and picked out a couple verses, you might suppose that the way that God is going to judge is that God is going to put your good deeds on one side of the scale and your bad deeds on the other side of the scale. And as long as the good outweighs the bad, then you're going to be, you're going to be set for eternity. Um, verse 7 of our text uh, talks about the person who does good. If it is the one who does good that inherits eternal life, the question I want to pose today is how good is good enough? If it is indeed the good person, the one who, who does the right thing, what does that look like uh, quantifiably? I want, I want us to think in terms of not just general description of a person, but more specific, how, how, does, it, how does it boil down to a person's um, actual life and um, the way that they live it out? Please remember that this entire flow of, of this section of Scripture, from Romans 1, 18, all the way to 3.20, is an attempt by Paul to establish the fact that all men are lost. So if you read this section of Scripture and you conclude, well, I'm okay, then you have concluded the very opposite thing that Paul intended for you to conclude by this passage. If all men need the gospel, Paul must establish that all are in danger of the judgment. And that's his point, and this is, this is really what this passage is trying to uh, to teach us today. I want to begin by asking a simple question, and that is, how will God judge? Well, when, when we talk about the judgment look like, crooked judges and less than perfect court system. Um, I remember all the way back, J trial. Um, 
I, I, I remember, because I was a young man at that time, that's how long ago it was, the OJ trial illustrated for all of us, I'm afraid that our court system is not about truth, it's about playing the system. And while in our hearts we want a court system, you know, a, a secular court system that seeks the truth, the fact of the matter is that quite often doesn't seek the truth, it, it uses a series of loopholes to dodge the truth. And, and that is very discouraging to us. It sets wrong with us. We think to ourselves, this is not the way that it should be. How does God judge? There are several indications in our text how God is going to judge when the time will come. Verse 2 says that God is going to judge truthfully. And in fact, in verse 2 it says, we know the judgment of God rightly falls. And, and then it describes how it, how it falls. Literally, the Greek says, the judgment of God is according to truth. I, I much prefer that translation because it, it strikes right at the heart of what Paul is saying. When God renders judgment, it will be judgment according to truth. God values the truth, doesn't he? And I think we've been created as creatures made in the image of God, and instinctively we value the truth as well. We know that there is such a thing as truth. Now, our secular society has disdained truth. Uh, our secular culture has cast it aside and said, well, there really isn't such a thing as truth. In fact, I read an article yesterday. Oh, my goodness. I, I'm, I, 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 keep, I keep saying to myself, I've heard it all. I've heard it all. Well, uh, I, I think I've heard it all, and, and, and something like this comes along. Yesterday, I, I read an article. The state of Oregon is now merging anti-racism with the teaching of mathematics. And what they have decided is that objectivity is racist. And so if you have only one answer to a mathematic problem, it's racist. I, I, I mean, I was just aghast. Um, Patty, uh, Terry Hartley's retired uh, math teacher, I, I was hoping to, to have him stand up today and explain this to all of us because I, I, I was just, I was befuddled. I mean, how, how can you have multiple right answers to a math problem? Well, that's what happens in postmodernism when a culture denies the truth. There is no objectivity. There is no right answer. There is no right and wrong. There is, in fact, no truth. truth and prejudices, what we want is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God, <laughs> all right? God will someday reveal the whole truth about your life and mine. The whole truth. I want to ask this question to you. Does the idea of revealing all the truth about your life, your thoughts, your secrets, all of it, does that make you nervous or does that make you comfortable? Just think about that. Is is the truth on display in its entirety something that makes you comfortable? Second element that we see of God's judgment is that he judges patiently. He judges patiently. Verse 4 of our text says the riches of his kindness and restraint and patience. That's how God judges. He doesn't ju jump to judgment. He doesn't you know, fly off the handle and, and um, act on a whim. God is patient and restrains his judgment. Um, I love this little uh, bit of poetry from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. He said, though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceedingly small. Though with patience he stands waiting, with exactness grinds he all. In other words, God might be patient, and he might restrain himself from judgment, 
But the fact of the matter is that he's going to render judgment someday, and he will render all judgment someday. This reminds us of several passages. I think of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, where we're told that the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. Do you remember how, how long it took to construct the ark? 120 years. Uh, Noah and his sons spent building a boat out in the middle of nowhere. And it took 120 years. Now, that's not just because God wanted to see if they could do it. It's because God wanted 120 years of preaching and opportunity for repentance to be extended to mankind. In our own day, it's similar. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. You ever wonder uh, to yourself, and in fact, man, this is a, a question that I ask myself often, I look at the fallen world in which we live in, and I say, dear Lord, when is enough enough? When are you going to say, I've had my fill? Um, obviously, God is more patient than we are. God is more restrained than we are. You know, if, if I were God, we'd, uh, we'd have put an end to lots of things a long, long time ago. But God knows that the more that he extends opportunity, the more we'll come to know him. God judges patiently. Thirdly, God judges righteously. The righteous judgment of God is mentioned in verse 5 of our text. God's judgment is righteous, and when we say righteous, that's a synonym for the word just. In other words, God's judgment renders justice, fairness. Now, we need to note here that justice does not necessarily mean you get what you want. Justice means that you get what you truly deserve. When we talk about God as judge, we're talking about him rendering justice, not what we perhaps want. We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later um, in our message. The, uh, the fact of the matter is that we, if we face God's judgment, we will get what we deserve, not necessarily what we want. And in that, um, in that same uh, genre of Verse 11, point D, God judges impartially. He judges impartially. It's verse 11 says, there is no partiality with God. God doesn't look at you and think, well, you're this kind of person as opposed to that kind of person, so I'll be easy on you, whereas I wouldn't be so easy on someone else. Um, the statue of Lady Justice shows a blindfolded woman holding the scales in an outstretched hand. I love this picture of justice because it, it really it illustrates well what we in, in Western society think of as true justice. It's a person who doesn't know, are you white or are you black? Are you rich or are you poor? Um, are you, you know, of this social attainment or, or are you of a, a lesser category? It's a blindfolded person who hears the evidence and renders judgment. What a great way of thinking about the impartiality of judgment. And God is going to judge impartially. Now let me insert here, and this is important for us to remember as we transition to my second point, when we talk about the forgiveness of our sins, we're not relating to God as judge. We're relating to him as redeemer. Those are two totally different concepts. And you might ask yourself, do I want in God a judge or do I want in God a redeemer? A lot of people think that what they want is a fair God. I would suggest to you that what you should want is a Redeemer. 
and of course we're gonna we're gonna tie that in as uh, we move further on uh, in this passage second main point that I want to address is how has man regarded God's judgment I mean God's judgment is coming he's told us about it you can be sure we've seen it acted out in days gone by so how does mankind respond to the fact that someday God is going to judge us all. Now, you would think that mankind is, is aware of God's pending judgment, and we say to ourselves, we better get right with God. We, we, we better amend our ways. We, we better see to it that we're the people that he's called us to be. So how has mankind responded to this impending judgment? One thing that we see in our text is that we have engaged in self-justification. Self-justification. Verse 1 says, every one of you who passes judgment. Verse 3 says, you foolish person who passes judgment on others. That's what we do. In order to, to justify ourselves, we look around and we find some poor schmuck who's worse than we are. And we point to them and we say, well, look at them. Isn't that terrible? And we feel better because, after all, we can look, you know, we, we assume the moral high ground and we look down on someone else. By passing judgment on others, we feel an easing of our own guilt. And we all do it, and we all do it rather naturally. Uh, it's part of what makes us feel good about the evening news, we, we can turn on the news and we say, man, the world is such a mess. I'm glad I'm not a mess, right? I mean, that, that's, that's kind of our, our follow-up thought. Um, last week, we preached from a very difficult passage, Romans chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. By the way, did you notice that I did not give to you a 10-page outline this week? All of God's people said, amen. Uh, but part of the danger of last week's message is that we look at, at the subject of that message and we conclude that because there are people who are so bad, we are okay. That's a very real danger. And that's precisely why Paul doesn't just stop at chapter 1 and say, okay, here's proof how wicked mankind is. Because we would be tempted to look at that and conclude, well, yeah, that's, that's those evil people, but that's not me. We spend so much of our time talking about the sin of others that we never get around to examining ourselves. I've always thought it would be an interesting thing to do to take my traveling clipboard and, and a microphone and go down to Fountain Square and ask people if they are sinners. I'm, I'm serious. I, I, think that, I think that would be... Uh, it would be a, a very uh, eye-opening discussion. I, I'm pretty sure we would hear answers like, a sinner? Oh, you mean like murderers and rapists and uh, robbers, those kinds of people. Oh, no, that's not me. Th those people belong in jail. I, I mean, I'm not perfect, but I'm not a sinner, right? I mean, that, that's, that tends to be our, our mentality. Well, um, how sad it is when we attempt to uh, justify ourselves by looking down on others. And this passage makes it clear that that is the wrong response to God's impending judgment. Secondly, mankind has, re, has re regarded God's judgment by not repenting. Verse 5 of our text says, Your stubbornness and unrepentant heart. The nature of God's judgment, particularly its patience, should cause us to repent. It is God's intent that the knowledge that he's going to judge us, his willingness to be patient and forestall his judgment, that that would work on our hearts. And it would cause us to change our mind about what we do and how we act. God's judgment and our own guilt should immediately cause us to regret what we have done and change our minds about what we're going to do in the future. But typically it doesn't. Paul says, 
even though you have God's judgment, even though he is patient in the process, still we don't repent. Verse 4, point C, presume. We are involved in presumption. We presume upon the patience of God. Verse 4 says, do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and restraint and patience? And the implied answer is, yes, you do. You assume that since God is patient, that he's not going to judge you. You assume that since he doesn't lash out in anger immediately, that he's okay with everything that's going on. He's not. Let me suggest there are three primary ways that we presume. Number one, we presume with this thought, there will always be another chance. There will always be another chance. How many people do you know who say, well, you know, I'm going to get serious about my relationship with God. Just not today. Just not today. Um, we used to sing a song in church when I was a kid. One of the saddest songs, I'm not even sure why it ever made it into the hymn book. Almost Persuaded. You remember that song? Oh, my. And you have to sing it with a frown on your face, and, and it has to be way slow, and the organ has to be, you know, dreary notes, you know, almost persuaded. But that, I mean, that's mankind. That, that's how we respond to God's, to God's impending judgment. We presume that he's, he's not going to, he's really not going to judge us. Second thing that we do is we suggest that God really will not judge anyone. Not only am I okay, but really everybody's okay. After all, God is a warm, loving God, isn't he? In fact, we even have people who take the scriptures and they try to, they try to pit the God of the Old Testament and, and his judgment, the severity of his judgment, against the God of the New Testament, who is a kind, gracious, loving God. And they say, well, you know, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. I like the God of the New Testament. I am a, I, I'm, I'm one that prefers the New Testament God. Um, same God. Uh, you just need to look at the facts a little bit closer. But the truth of the matter is that Satan has done a great job selling us on the warm, fuzzy God who will not judge anyone. One of my very, very favorite quotations from C.S. Lewis comes from The Problem of Pain. And um, I would recommend this book for your reading. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful little book. But he talks about this very problem. He says, what would really satisfy us would be a God who said of anything we happened to like doing, what does it matter so long as they are contented? We want, in fact, not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven, a senile benevolence who, as they say, liked to see young people enjoying themselves and whose plan for the universe was simply that it might be truly said at the end of each day, a good time was had by all. Wow. <laughs> What a great summation of mankind's response to God as judge. He's, he's a loving God. He just wants your happiness. That's all he's concerned about. Third way that we presume. God's judgment is for someone, just some people, are inclined to presume based upon God's patience in judgment. So what's the final result in all of this? What's the bottom line when we, when we look at all that Paul is saying about God's judgment? From verse 8 of our text, the first thing that I would see here is that evil is punished. He says that specifically, verses 8 and 9, to those who do not obey the truth, wrath, and indignation. Is God capable of wrath? Uh, you might consult Sodom and Gomorrah. You might consult 
Noah and the flood that uh, wiped out mankind. Um, you know, look at God's judgment on Judah. Look at God's judgment on Israel. God's judgment on Babylon. God's judgment on Assyria. God's judgment. I mean, hello. God is capable, is he not? Evil will be punished. God is certainly going to condemn and punish the wicked. And at this point, we say, yes, and emphasis on the wicked. Right? That's, that's kind of where we line up. The second thing that we read in this text is that the righteous are going to be rewarded. The righteous are going to be rewarded. Verse 7 and 10, to those who persevere in doing good, eternal life. Now we are getting in there. That's, that's what we want to hear. We want to hear talk of eternal life. We don't want to hear talk of God's impending judgment and uh, his wrath poured out on us. We want to hear talk about eternal life. And here it says the righteous will be rewarded. Now, I want to draw it all to, to a head and ask this, who are the righteous? Who is who in this text? More importantly, who are you? in this text. Who am I? We've spoken a great deal in this message about the way that God will be a perfect judge. That's what we want, is it not? Um, let me just, let me ask you point blank. Do you want the Lord to be completely fair and righteous and judge you according to what you deserve? Well, this is kind of a, a yes and no. Yes, I want God to be a perfect, righteous judge. I mean, we want him to be true to his character. We want there to be such a thing as truth. We want the truth to matter. But when we start unpacking our own lives and viewing it under the microscope of God's judgment, the truth of the matter is that what we deserve seems less and less an option that we're interested in. See, before you answer this question about do you want God to judge you fairly, before you answer that question, you might remember that God is going to judge you knowing everything about you, all the skeletons in your closet, all the secret thoughts of your heart, all your evil deeds that you thought no one else knew about, all of your impure motivation, God knows it all. All of it. In light of what the Bible says about what each, is, each of us deserves, I'm not sure we want justice. In fact, I don't know about you. I'll speak for myself. I do not want justice on Judgment Day. I do not want God to judge me according to what I deserve and reward me accordingly. That's not what I want. It's tough for us to come to this realization. And this is why this passage is so very important. Because our our desire is to think we're okay. Our desire is to suppose, well, God is a loving God, and we're better than most people, and we give him a pretty decent effort. And after all, if you pile up my good deeds here and my bad deeds here, obviously I, I'm, I'm, I'm on the right side of the scales, right? It is true that uh, you might be able to make a case for your own justification based upon a quantitative analysis of what you do right versus what you do wrong. The problem is that we're not playing baseball. This isn't you can bat 300 and be a hero. The problem is that God expects a certain level of righteousness from us. No one else more rotten than themselves. We can all do that. 
theoretically, everyone in the world can do that except one person, right? (laughs) So, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, um, verses 9 through 18, that everyone has fallen short of God's glory. Everyone stands condemned before God. Everyone is in danger of his judgment. So again, this is terrible. How is this good news? I mean, I thought, I thought the book of Romans was all about the good news of the gospel. I thought that's what the gospel is, is good news. This sounds like not very good news to me. And you're right about that. It does sound like not very good news. Justice for each of us, justice for the whole world, that will be condemnation and judgment. On God's perfect scales of justice, you cannot expect to be innocent unless you are completely innocent, sinless. Wow. We fool ourselves if we think that we can be good enough. We fool ourselves if we think that God's standard of perfection won't be used to judge us. You say, well, then what's the point? Why am I here? Why do I bother? That's a good question. Why are you here? If you've come here because in your mind you are going to perform and please God, then you've already failed because I'm pretty sure you're not perfect. Now, if anyone would like to make the case that they are, please stand up and be heard. Chirping crickets, okay, that's, that's good, that's good. But you say, well, then how can this be good news? Well, here's how this can be good news. The book of Romans does not end with the passage that we read. The book of Romans does not end with, and judgment rightly falls on everyone. The book of Romans goes on to describe that God, even though he is a perfect judge, is, someone, is, a, is a judge who wants mercy for us. And he extends grace to us by taking our penalty for us. That's truly good news. Now let me just say this. There are people inclined to think that we should not talk about sin. We ought not talk about God's condemnation. I would suggest to you this. The good news is is good news. In fact, it's way good news when we realize how bad news the bad news is. The bad news that we've fallen short, sent his son to die for us. That he wants to take our punishment upon himself. Then we step back and we say, you've got to be kidding me. Who would do that? The Lord God of heaven and earth would do that. That's how good the good news is. And so when it comes to this whole issue of how do we relate to God, you'd better relate to God as redeemer, not judge. If you do not choose God as a redeemer, you will get God as a judge. Praise God that we need not relate to him as judge. Praise God that he has provided a means of being redeemed. Let's bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you that though our sins uh, make us unacceptable in your sight, though it It has drived a wedge between us. Yet your marvelous love, your patience and your grace has extended to us the opportunity to be brought back to you. We thank you for Jesus who makes it possible. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. And Father, we pray that we would embrace the truth that all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. But there is cleansing through the blood of your Son, through whom we pray. Amen.
For our communion time, I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 18. Paul says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The practice of remembering the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus each week through this memorial 
does not make sense to those who are outside the church. Some think it rather outlandish or bizarre or even utter foolishness. In the first two centuries of the church, Christians were accused of a variety of things. One of the more unusual things they were accused of, disciples of Jesus were accused of being guilty of cannibalism. The persecutors of early Christians just knew that Christians were, quote, eating the body and blood, unquote, of someone named Jesus Christ. To them, without an attempt to learn or understand, and only a desire to condemn and defame, they concluded that Christians were guilty of being cannibals. In our day, non-Christians think it rather odd that we take a few crumbs of bread, a thimble full of grape juice, we refer to it as the Lord's Supper or a spiritual feast. In their minds, the odd elements found at the table are about as reasonable as believing that someone who died 2,000 years ago has anything to do with our sins. The world has always thought that the message of the cross was foolish. It is that way today. Like the Romans and the Greeks 2,000 years ago, our culture is filled with people who are self-proclaimed wise men, reliant upon no one. The idea of dependence on God in general, and even more so, dependence on a Savior who died in our place, is sure foolishness and certainly a sign of weakness. The self-made individual of our time scorns the cross of Jesus in the faith of the New Testament. But to those of us who are being saved, the cross is the power of God. It is through the cross that God worked on our behalf, a work that we could never do for ourselves. It was at the cross that our weakness and our sin were overcome by God's grace and God's power that made all the difference. We come here today to remember Jesus and his suffering death on our behalf. We come to remember and to worship the one who died so that we did not have to. We do not care what the world may think. God in his wisdom has chosen to save us through that foolish cross. As we eat the bread and drink the cup, We remember Jesus. We shun the mocking of the world, and instead, we embrace the wisdom and power, the cross and our Savior. Let's bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Father, in our time of worship, we now come before you, and we thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ. We remember him as we eat the bread, as we drink the cup, we remember his broken body, his shed blood. We thank you for your power as displayed through the cross. And we thank you for all that means to us, not just now, but for all of eternity. And we pray through Jesus. Amen.
want to remind you that on March the 7th, we are going to be gathering in a single service as opposed to two services, and hopefully from that point on, we will all be together as a church family um, until we grow to such a point where we need to go to two services for other than uh, uh, COVID reasons. But uh, that's going to take place on March the 7th. Uh, the service will be at the 1030 so time slot, just like we were doing church a year ago. Uh, remember a year ago? And so a little bit, a little return to, norma to, to some normalcy, and we're grateful for that. Uh, we're also going to be running our children's programs during that hour. There will be a nursery, a preschool, uh, a younger elementary age, and a kids' town church. If you can help uh, in one of those time, one of those uh, classes, one of those spots, just once a month, that would be great, and we need your help. We're doing our best to put volunteers together, and and then we need to encourage as well families with kids to come back and join us and uh, and be part of that. All right, keep that all in your prayers. Let's bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege of worship. We thank you for the joy of celebrating the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. Lord, in light of uh, our sin and your judgment, uh, the good news truly is good news. Help us to share that with those all around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.